Road trips have always been our preferred mode of travel, something my wife and I had started when we were younger. And let me tell you, we've seen and experienced some pretty wild things on our trips, but nothing more unsettling than one night we spent in a bed and breakfast in rural Louisiana. We were headed south, quite eager to escape the frigidity of Minnesota winter and to bask in the warmth of the southern sun for a time. There is a freewheeling sense of adventure in hitting the road without a clear plan. And Louisiana, with its blend of vibrant traditions and haunting American history, seemed as good a destination as any. Our bed and breakfast was surprisingly quaint considering the bustling city around us. We managed to find this little place nestled amongst towering cypress trees, all draped in Spanish moss. It was lovely. The place had a certain antebellum charm, porch swings, gingerbread trim, and these tall white columns framing the building. It was promising to be a nice break from our winter weather back home. We spent the day exploring the local area. Louisiana's magic is hard to resist. We returned to our lodging by late afternoon and spent an hour chatting it up with the innkeeper. She was a local and gave us a little bit of history and tales of the town. Before turning in for the night, we took a stroll around the property. Something drew us towards the back, and suddenly we found ourselves standing in front of a nearby swamp. The old dark water held an eerie stillness that sent a shiver down my spine. I shrugged it off, attributing it to the ghost stories that were shared earlier. We headed back to the room. It had been a long day and we were both eager to get some sleep. But when we got there, a strange smell filled the room. It was a burnt smell, but there was something sour and rotten there along with it. I asked my wife if she noticed it too, but she waved it off as an old house smell. By then, we were too exhausted from our day to dwell on it further, so we climbed into bed. A sudden noise jolted us awake. Barely an hour later, I wasn't sure what it was, either a growl or a deep screaming roar. We tried to locate the source of it, but my mind was still clouded with sleep and I struggled to come to the realization of what was happening. We heard it again, louder this time. A crawling sense of unease took over, and we turned on the bedside lamp. My heart pounded in my chest. I almost didn't want to see what the light was going to reveal. The room, bathed in a warm halo of light, seemed different. The antique furniture, the faded wallpaper, the cracked mirror, everything suddenly seemed menacing. A feeling of dread pooled in my stomach as I noticed a shadow stretching from the center of the room towards our bed. My wife grabbed my arm and pointed towards the ceiling. Her face twisted in fear. It was difficult to discern at first, but the ceiling held a pattern of something dark and fluid, like wisps of smoke held in place. It was shifting and reforming, almost as if it were alive. We didn't know what was happening above us. The air became heavy, suffocating almost as a nauseous, rotten smell seemed to grow. The apparition, or whatever it was, that hung above us continued to dance around the ceiling. The shadow at the edge of the room crept closer. The roars rang out again, echoing around the room. They were clearer that time, and the worst part? They sounded like they were coming from directly beneath us. Acting on instinct, we rushed out of our room and down the creaky staircase, searching for someone to help us. When we peered down from the top of the stairs, our hearts nearly stopped. The innkeeper was standing on the ground floor, surrounded by strange symbols drawn on the floor in what looked like blood. As she chanted, the room seemed to grow darker, and a tall figure began to take shape in the center of the floor. Whatever the things we had seen in our room, this was worse. It towered over everything, horns jutted from its head and its eyes glowing a fiery red. The creature had huge wings, like those of a bat and clawed hands that curled in anticipation. I could feel my heart pounding in my throat and my wife's hands squeezing mine in terror. The air was thick now with sulfur and all of a sudden the air around us became unbearably hot. Out of pure fear, we walked back up the stairs as silently as we could. Once at the top, we bolted for our room, grabbed our stuff and got the hell out of there leaving the keys on the hallway table as we ran out of the front door. It was deep into the night, and we drove in silence, neither of us knowing what to say or feel. We kept driving until morning when the sun began to peek over the horizon. It was then that we finally felt the terror ebbing away. 
leaving behind a strange mixture of relief and bewilderment. For days after that encounter, we didn't dare talk about it, fearing that somehow it might just make it more real. It was only after we returned to Minnesota that we gathered the courage to discuss what we saw. Part of me hopes it was some shared hallucination brought on from a disagreeable dinner or perhaps too much to drink. I mean, how could something like that even be real? It sounds completely insane, I know, but it happened. I wouldn't have believed it either if I hadn't seen it for myself. I don't think we'll ever go back to the South for another vacation anytime soon. Let me tell you, this was a doozy of a night. I'm an avid hiker. You know, one of those folks who trades the bright city lights for a star-flecked sky in the middle of nowhere. This happened during one of those nights of wanderlust. It's a few years back now, over in Sedona. Pretty place, Sedona, Arizona. Red rocks, arid yet incredibly vibrant. You might guess I particularly favor the night hikes. There's something very in the moment about walking under a starlit sky. It's an adventure that's both soothing and kind of exhilarating. There I was, preparing to scale one of the trails that takes you through the heart of the desert landscape. Rough and arid plains spotted with sparse greenery. It's a whole different world at night, I'm telling you. Quiet, serene. Animals you wouldn't normally see during the day come out to roam. You feel alone and yet, in a peculiar manner, very much involved. You're a part of their world. I bet that's how people used to feel, generations before cities and day jobs. I had my pack slung over my shoulder, some trail mix, a flashlight, plenty of water, and had just begun my steady ascent along the beaten path. There really isn't much about these adventures that worries me anymore. Years of these hikes teach you two things, appreciation and respect. I was, however, unaware that the night was set to test my resolve and teach me a third lesson, fear. I was nearly halfway in. The crystal clear sky was above me. The red clay of the trail glowed faintly like some Martian landscape. I had a pair of small binoculars with me too, mostly to watch nocturnal birds and the occasional curious critters. I saw a ringtail cat rustling through some dry bushes, a familiar sight in these parts. It was blissfully unaware of me. As time wore on, the nocturnal desert sounds I'd come to find comforting seemed to grow quieter. You know, the little rustles and distant calls of wildlife. Things that should have been background noise but, in their absence, felt like the silence before a gruesome storm. I didn't think much of it, rationalizing it away as maybe a predator lurking nearby. That usually sends the little guys into hiding. I wouldn't expect a fox or a coyote to approach me though. I was safe, I thought. As I moved further along the trail, I began to feel it, an eeriness. It was a sensation best described as walking across someone's grave, uncomfortable and unsettling. It was like I was doing something wrong, and my body knew it. I could feel the hairs on the back of my neck standing up. The air suddenly felt icy. I shrugged it off initially. Desert nights can be cold, but this, this was different. Then came the sound. It was faint like stones being moved or falling. Seemed to be coming from up ahead, somewhere off the trail. I stopped, just stood still, trying to pick it out again. But there was nothing besides the unnatural quiet settling over the desert evening. At that moment, I felt it. I can't say for sure what it was, but I felt, watched, hunted maybe? A shudder passed through me. Despite the rational part of my brain loudly reminding me that I was likely alone in the desert, the sensation was hard to shake. A clatter snapped me out of my head louder than before. It was then I realized what I was hearing seemed less like falling stones and more like claws on rocks. The nocturnal desert, which once left me with an impression of being alive, now felt frighteningly alien. Something about the night was off, but quite honestly, I didn't realize then just how off it was about to get. It felt like a monstrous game of cat and mouse was about to begin. I swear it was like a scene straight out of a pulpy horror novel. My dad used to read those. I didn't think they were based on true stories. Backing down wasn't an option, and I thought it best to continue along the trail. I hoped it was merely my imagination running wild in the wilderness. 
So, flashlight in hand, I ventured onward. I was unaware of the encounter that was waiting for me. The encounter would serve as a permanent reminder of the desert's most frightening mysteries. The night was about to turn into one of the most uncanny experiences of my life. Anyway, there I was, caught in this strange pocket of silence, when something darted out from the bushes on the side of the trail. This thing moved faster than anything I'd ever seen. It wasn't quite lizard-like. It was up on two feet, man. Two feet. And this sucker was big. Nothing like the lizards you usually see scampering across the rocks. The sight nearly knocked the wind out of me. It was covered in scales that shimmered under the moonlight. I can't estimate its height precisely. It towered over me, so it must have been at least six feet tall. That's when real fear set in, the kind that roots you to the spot. It darted across my path, quicker than I could blink, and looked back at me for just a moment before disappearing into the bush on the other side. Yellow eyes, piercing as the desert sun, stared straight at me. I swear it felt colder than any winter's night. If anyone told me this story, I would have had a good laugh. But standing there, I knew I'd encountered something truly indescribable. Something unnatural. My stomach was in knots with a gaping tension that wouldn't dissipate. Despite the fear gnawing at me, curiosity prevailed, and I forced myself to move. Soon, I was standing in the spot where the creature had crossed. In the dust of the trail was the clear impression of a large triangular footprint. I could see the outline of massive claws protruding from the imprint. It was like nothing I'd seen on my hikes. Evidence that this wasn't just my imagination running wild. I stayed on that trail for a while, almost hoping to catch another glimpse, perhaps to better understand what I had seen. But the desert was quiet once again, and the creature was gone as suddenly as it had come. Yet I knew the wilderness and my hikes would never feel the same again. In the days following, I couldn't get the image out of my head. The creature's scale-covered body, its odd gait, the yellow of its eyes. I was awestruck but also wary. I didn't know what to make of this encounter. Didn't know if I was ready for what the desert could hold beyond the familiar. I finally shared this story with a few of my hiking buddies, half expecting them to rib me about nighttime desert mirages. Instead, I was greeted with stories of similar encounters and most prominently of the urban legend of the reptilian, a creature of many mysteries and few sightings. Their accounts gave me a little comfort. Strangely, this encounter also left me with a broader perspective. It's easy to become complacent and overconfident when you believe you know everything there is to know. That night, the desert trail, which I'd hiked countless times before, showed me an entirely new face. It made me reassess my place in the wilderness I so dearly loved. So, there it is. A tale worth telling, I believe. To all listening, take it as wild fantasy or a warning. Remember this, each trail walked and each mountain climbed carries secrets we might never imagine until we encounter them. After all, one man's hike is another creature's stomping ground. It was the late spring of 2015. Boring start here, I'm sorry. But please bear with me. Back then, I was a plumber by trade in the heart of Santiago, Chile. Life was routine. Go to work, fix leaky pipes and clogged toilets, head home, repeat. Nothing was ever out of the ordinary, except for this one job. Nobody likes the job that comes in late on a Friday. Structural issues down at the Santiago subway, they said. An entire tunnel was flooded. Who wants to go waist deep into the subway's plumbing after a long week of work? Not me. I was hesitant going in and not just because I was eager for the weekend. I'd been to the subway countless times but never in the dead of night. Never inside its murky, stinking underbelly. I talked myself into the job by offering a trip into the desert as my little weekend reward. The Atacama Desert stretching north of Santiago had always fascinated me. So I figured, fix the leak in a record time, then head to the desert. It's a bizarre kind of vacation, I admit. Something about the vastness, the desolation. It's the driest place on earth, you know. It made me feel small, in a good way, if that's possible. Down in the subway, the fluorescent lights casted a haunting glow, like low-hanging fog. 
I spotted water seeping from a jagged crack in the wall. It reeked something awful, like the smell of the deep earth mixed with rotting garbage or sulfur. It was more than just a puddle. The enclosed space was almost flooded. Whoever was on the previous shift must have been asleep. I waded carefully through the murky water, tools in hand, but my usually methodical demeanor was compromised as strange things started happening. As soon as I switched on my flashlight, the thick darkness peeled away to reveal the wet cement walls glistening with an odd sheen. The subway's usual soundtrack of dripping water and distant rumbling trains was now replaced by a peculiar hum. A weird feeling took hold of me. Something wasn't right. Something moved. I saw a flicker of movement in the wet gloom from the corner of my eye. Whirling around, I scanned the eerie space, but the beam of trusty flashlight revealed nothing except the shiny wet surfaces. The space seemed to shudder in the artificial light, but there was no one there. The closer I got to the leak, the stronger the smell became. I highlighted the crack in the wall. It was almost four feet up, odd for a waterline. The leak wasn't your standard waterline burst either. My flashlight illuminated the suspended droplets, each one cloudy and bizarre. Just water mixed with dirt, I tried to reassure myself. But the uncomfortable suspicion was rapidly turning into a knowing dread. Had it become quieter? I had not realized how muted the subway had become. The silence was as palpable as the stench. Suddenly, the beam of my flashlight fell onto shapes that were lurking on the wall, right beside the crack. There they were, three, four, maybe five figures darting in the shadows, humanoid, yet not quite. My heart pounded in my chest. I moved my light to get a better look, but something interrupted me, something in my mind. An intrusive thought, or rather, a series of them, like a record playing in my head. Warnings, please. My knees weakened as I struggled to comprehend their source. Do not come closer. Leave this place. But whose voice was it? The creatures were short, maybe four feet tall at the highest. They looked skinny and their heads were unusually large for their frames. They would have been comical if my skin wasn't already crawling. The dark subway tunnel made it difficult to make out their features, but one thing was evident, their eyes. Two enormous pitch black ovals on each face that seemed to absorb the light from my flashlight. I was paralyzed, caught between the urge to fix the problem and to run from a situation way above my pay grade. Suddenly, a bright light flooded the area. I looked up and a circular object, the size of a small car, floated down from above my head. It was like nothing I'd seen before. The strange beings I had met all came from this spaceship. Now it felt like they were inviting me on board. Unlikely as it seems, I found myself joining them. Inside, everything was alien yet familiar. A round space with tables made out of a material that looked like glass, but wasn't. The air smelled cleaner, sanitized almost. I was shelved onto a small hovering seat by the large-headed creature. Unable to resist, I began taking in the dashboard illuminated with an array of colors I can't quite describe. The colors made symbols that I can't quite remember. Like the first lesson of a foreign language, the dialect just doesn't stick. My mind became a whirlpool of questions and fascination, yet everything else was drowned out as one of the humanoid figures began to communicate with me. There was no sound in the traditional sense, only a soft whisper that seemed to echo in my mind. I sound crazy, don't I? I told you this story was more than its boring beginning. The creature shared details about where they had come from and why they were here. Like everything else about them, the information was too much to take in. Memories of my teenage years with my head buried in science fiction books came rushing back. This was nothing like those stories. My spine felt like one long icicle. The whispers grew stronger. The next thing I knew, I was standing back in the desert. The figures in their ship already disappeared, like a dream evaporating at dawn. But it was no dream, I know that. The enormous expanse of the barren, lifeless land around me suddenly seemed smaller than I remembered. Maybe I was too aware of the space above us, of our place in the stars. It was almost as if I could still feel the creature's presence. Their telepathic whispers echoed faintly in my mind. How could I go back to my mundane life fixing pipes after that? 
after experiencing something so out of this world. The loneliness of the Atacama Desert pressed down on me even more. I felt a deep ache of homesickness for my simple life. Not that I could shake off my sense of awe, obviously. Fascination was humming beneath my skin. I was trembling. It was a physical reaction to the otherworldly encounter I had that night. I still shake from time to time. Looking back, I wish I could say something more profound about my encounter. Some insight about life that affected me profoundly. All I can say is this. I've never forgotten that smell of alien sulfur. And every time I catch a whiff of it, I find myself simultaneously worried and hopeful. For even under the immense Chilean sky, I've realized we are never truly alone. And so, despite my solitude in the Atacama, I found a sense of unity. I still hope to see them again one day, even if it's just to ask a few of the thousands of questions bubbling in my mind. Trust me, the universe holds more mysteries than we on Earth could ever comprehend. I'd like to share an interesting encounter I had recently. I'd taken a summer road trip by myself out to Sedona, Arizona. It's a really cool place. I'm from the Midwest originally, so the desert is like an alien world to me. All those shades of reds and browns across the landscape was incredible. The sunsets out there seemed different too, like the sky was bigger or something. But that's not the real reason I chose Sedona as my road trip destination. I've always been fascinated by ancient cultures. Exploring ancient rock carvings, petroglyphs as the academics call them, has been a hobby of mine for the last few years. There's just something fascinating about it. To know that you are standing in the same place as someone who lived thousands of years ago. Now, Sedona is a bit of a gold mine when it comes to that stuff. There are loads of petroglyphs there, all over the landscape. On the particular evening in question, I'd driven out past the main city away from the humdrum of civilization and into the heart of the desert. I found myself exploring a spot I had read about on my way out here. Supposedly, there were some impressively detailed carvings on the rock faces nearby. It was a warm summer evening, a blanket of stars overhead, the kind of scene that makes you feel wonderfully insignificant. Now, after about an hour of searching, I got lucky. An impressive formation of rocks jutting out from the sandy earth caught my attention. Even from a distance, I saw the petroglyphs etched onto it. As I got closer, I realized one drawing in particular was quite peculiar. It was strange to see something like that. From what I could tell, it was a depiction of a Sasquatch-like figure. You know the kind I'm talking about. A tall, bulky figure with arms hanging low and a massive ape-like head. Now I've examined loads of petroglyphs before, and I've never come across a drawing like that. It got me wondering just how old the legend of Bigfoot really is. I know that some Native American tribes speak of the creature in their legends, but this is awfully far back into prehistory. It was a curious thought, but not one I dwelled on. I was more interested in the carving in front of me. I was engrossed in my examinations, and I didn't notice anything else around me. I was suddenly broken from my trace by a strange noise in the distance. At first it was faint, like a low growl, a bit of background wind, maybe the low hum of a distant car, I thought. But then it grew, louder and more distinct. It was not a car and certainly not the wind. This was something else. There was some animal out here with me. I stopped as my eyes were darting around in the dark, desperately trying to figure out the source of the sound. Most of the desert animals are harmless, but there are a few you don't want to cross. It was starting to get dark, and I had this feeling of oncoming dread or fear, I'm not sure. But I knew I wanted to get back to my truck as soon as possible. I quickly packed up my things and made a note of the location of the carving so I could come back the next day and snap some photos of it in better lighting. I should have left the moment I heard that growl, but my interest in the petroglyph kept my attention. And then, out of the corner of my eye, silhouetted against the starlit sky, was a figure standing tall among the clusters of ancient sandstones. At first, I thought it was just part of the landscape, just another of the towering rock formations. But the breeze picked up, and I could see its hair moving in the wind. Its whole body was covered in hair, and when I focused my eyes towards it, I realized that I was looking at the creature 
that was depicted in the rocks in front of me. Now my mind was scrambling. It was playing tricks, right? This couldn't be happening. But as I focused, my uncertainty became an undeniable reality. The figure easily had to be around eight to nine feet tall. It was a ways away, but I could still make an accurate description of it. The creature had this undeniably ape-like face. There was no other animal out here in the desert that I could have mistaken it for, unless a gorilla had escaped from one of the local zoos, but there's just no way. This was taller than any gorilla, and it was at ease on two legs. The outline of it was in the form of a man, so similar that I wondered if maybe the creature was some part of human evolution that simply branched off and chose to live in the wilds. For a moment, it watched me watching it, and then it broke our standoff with a long howl. The noise filled the air and bounced off the canyons, echoing throughout the entirety of the desert. Adrenaline was pumping through my veins, but I was too frozen in shock to do anything except observe. Right after the last echo faded, the figure turned and walked away, disappearing behind another cliff formation. I stood there in the desert, knees shaking and heart pounding. I don't think the experience had quite registered with me then. I walked back to the truck, doing my best to just put one foot in front of the other. Once I was safely inside, only then did the realization slowly ebb in. I had just seen a creature I thought only existed in myths and legends. I wondered if maybe that carving on the rocks was a warning of the creature that lived nearby. Or who knows, maybe the creature did it itself. That's an interesting thought. I had the distinct pleasure of staying in this idyllic cabin in the wilds of Michigan for my last vacation. It was something I had been planning for a while. The cabin was a hidden gem, nestled between towering pines, with a gorgeous view of the nearby lake. Perfect place to be in the dead middle of nowhere, if you like that kind of thing. And I did. Now I had heard a bit about this place before I arrived, mostly about the numerous hiking trails and fishing spots. But there was one other thing. There was an urban legend of a creature known as the Dog Man, who was said to live somewhere in the wilderness nearby. Now, I never believed in things like that, and if I'm being totally honest, I thought it was a bit ridiculous. Famous last words and all that. On the day of my arrival, the woods around me felt unnaturally quiet. Easily explainable, though. Now, the woods are never really quiet if you take a moment to listen. You'll hear chirping birds, squirrels, chipmunks, all sorts of little creatures scurrying about. When the woods are quiet, that's when you have to worry. That means there's a predator in the area. However, a lot of these little forest critters think humans are predators. The animals here aren't like the ones in the city that come right up to you looking for a snack. These ones are wild. They think you are a danger, and they clear out as soon as they see or smell you. So, given how isolated the cabin was, I wasn't surprised that all the wildlife ran for cover the minute I showed up. I got there and took my time unpacking and exploring my surroundings. Beyond the cabin grounds, it was eternal green. Forgotten trails led me deep into the woodland, and in the distance, a brook bubbled up from the ground. I did a bit of hiking that first day and didn't see anything out of the ordinary. The woods were still quiet, but I figured the locals just weren't used to me yet. That night, I started to notice a putrid, acrid smell hanging around the cabin. At first, I dismissed it as the scent of the wild, maybe a skunk or something decaying in the woods. But this smell was different. It was a more unnatural and revolting stench, quite unlike anything I'd ever experienced. I tried to shake it off. I started a fire in the wood stove, hoping that maybe the scent of the wood smoke would suffocate the strange stench. And it did a little, but it was still there in the end. That smell hung around for the next few days. It was strange, but even stranger, I thought, was that I hadn't seen one wild animal since I arrived. Not one squirrel. Not even a bird. That was unusual. And frankly, concerning. I was just starting to think about cutting my trip short. I just couldn't shake that feeling that something wasn't right. My suspicions were confirmed later that night, as I was getting into bed. Out of nowhere, I heard this deep howl outside my cabin. It didn't sound like a coyote or even a wolf. It was a deeper, more melancholy sound. 
I dashed to the window, but all I saw were the murky woods. I ended up going into town the next day to chat with some of the locals. I sat down at the one bar and grill in town and found some people to talk to on their lunch break. I mentioned the strange smell around the cabin, the lack of wildlife, and the strangely deep howl. I was told that wolves weren't common in the area, but there seems like there was something else they weren't telling me. I ended up heading back to the cabin with more questions than answers. I decided I would go talk to the man who rented me the cabin later that night, Mr. Todd. He lived a few miles down the road on the adjoining property. He was a bit of an odd duck when I met him the first time. I don't think he was terribly well liked around town. I ended up swinging by around dusk, unsure of if he had a day job or not. He was on his porch when I pulled in, but it was like he didn't even notice me. He was standing at the edge of the porch, facing the forest like he was intently watching something. When I reached him, I couldn't help but notice his odd silhouette. He seemed different than when I had seen him before. He had this unusually muscular and hunched stature. His back seemed broader than I had remembered it. He sniffed the air like a dog and then turned around to face me. His eyes were not his own. They were this golden amber color. They were like a wolf's eyes. He looked completely feral. It took him a moment to register who I was like he was coming out of a trance or something. His eyes flashed to brown again and he screamed at me. He told me to get out. Get out now and don't come back until morning. I don't think I was quite able to comprehend what was taking place, but I got in my truck and squealed out of there as fast as I could. I locked myself in the cabin that night. I heard the creature howling outside, but it didn't approach the cabin. My mind was racing. Could Mr. Todd be... No, that was impossible. I can't even bring myself to write out my thoughts. It just couldn't be. I had to see Mr. Todd again when I dropped off the keys to the cabin. He seemed normal then, and we didn't talk at all about that night that I stopped in. The night he had those yellow eyes. I still can't believe my own story. Or the possibility that Mr. Todd isn't quite human. And the thought that there might be others out there like him. It's a bit too much to think about for me.